David, I really enjoyed last week's discussion where you raised a, a series of, of policy issues. We went through them quickly. Can we do the same thing again this week? That sounds like a great idea. Well, probably the most pressing issue or the one that's gotten the most attention is that ASN and the National Kidney Foundation sent a letter to the National Governors Association and the National Council of State Legislatures around rationing care, particularly for people with, with kidney failure, and, and, and obviously a lot of this has to do with ventilators. Just wondering if you could describe the letter and, and what ASN and NKF are trying to accomplish. Well, I think that what ASN and, and NKF are doing here is really important, which is they are saying we understand that there's a crisis. We understand that there's the limitations to what can be done in this crisis, but let's not forget our basic ethics. And the basic ethics are we don't discriminate against patients based on pre-existing conditions or any other healthcare issues. And to say that in this crisis, when ventilators are in short demand, that you might automatically remove a COVID-19 pa uh, patient from consideration because they also have kidney failure um, is just wrong. It's, it, it's wrong in our opinion, and it's wrong in, in, from, when I say our, I mean collectively, the two organizations. So what's the next step? So you've sent the letter um, to these two organizations. You're trying to raise awareness um, among the governors and the, and the state legislators. Um, where do you go from here? Well, I think this is one of those issues where sunlight is the greatest disinfectant if there's a problem that needs to be addressed. And the more you, you focus on it and the more you call attention to it, the more the conversation, I think, kind of comes back around and people realize perhaps that's not the best approach at this moment. So I think by beginning to call it out and to approach it in that way, um, in the full light of day, I think it really bears reexamination. Um, and also, in the full light of day with a full conversation, I think it kind of it also kind of dampens the enthusiasm of other state governments or entities to consider putting out such a policy as well. Because I think we're making it very clear um, that we're saying, you know, at, at one point we wrote, while ASN and NKF recognize the COVID-19 pandemic, we go on to say this is basically an arbitrary denial of an American, treat American for treatment due to a pre-existing health condition. Or disability, and that's that's just a, a a a place that we have decided that we don't want to go as a society any longer, and that's one of the things that's happened in the in the last 20 years. We to get away from really putting a ban or putting any prohibition on people because of pre-existing conditions. What's the federal? I mean, this is really focused at a state level, and, and the laws vary by state. What's happening at a at a federal level to try to address this issue? Well, I think the federal government has had a, a, a lot of different um, approaches to dealing with the ventilator issue. It's been something we've all heard discussed a lot. Uh, and I think that, that at some level, you could call, go back to the discussion about making sure that we have an adequate supply of ventilators. And that that is true. That is something that could be done and both on state level and on federal level. But at the same time, it's also not about ventilators. It's also about a much bigger issue. And this is one of those where I believe that, that calling out the bigger issue is probably the issue is something that really is important and will really resonate with people. So you mentioned the challenges with supplies of ventilators. There's also been a lot written about challenges around personal uh, protective equipment. Um, recently, there were news accounts in terms of um, some challenges with supplies. What's gotten less attention has been some of the, the challenges with the workforce. And um, I know your second issue was around um, ASN trying to promote the work of the American Nephrology Nurses Association related to helping to identify uh, nephrology nurses to help in hotspots. Um, what's happening in that situation? Well, a lot of hotspots have put out a call for more um, healthcare professionals to come in and to assist them. And policy-wise, one of the things that we all worked on very early on was making sure that those, those individuals, uh, doctors and nurses and so forth, could travel across state lines as long as they had um, an existing license in another state from which they came. So that was one of the first things policy-wise we, we did. Now we're in a situation where, uh, as we are reading and seeing, and you've heard about a great deal, I know, um, there is 
some concern about um, AKI, um, acute kidney injury, uh, developing with COVID-19 patients in the hospital. Um, and so there has been a, a need for more nephrology nurses in some of the hot spots. And there's been a call from some of those facilities, hospitals, and, and the like to say we need help here. We need nephrology nurses specifically. I know other nurses are being requested, uh, but nephrology nurses are very much in demand. And particularly ones that that have seen a lot of different modalities in use, like like peritoneal dialysis. So ANA has created a web page on their website, uh, which is their website is www.annanurse.org, and they have put together a page on their website that is specifically about the need for nephrology nurses in COVID-19 hotspots. And so if you go to that web page, it will, it will link you into an interactive map of the United States and let you see where are there places where they have put out a call for nephrology nurses. And it is interactive. It does change daily. I know there's been some changes. It not only allows you to um, go and see if you could be, if your services would be needed elsewhere, but it also allows facilities and institutions to go on and actually announce that they are in need of nephrology nurses. So it does connect both ends, both the nephrology nurses who can go and travel and help, also those facilities and organizations that are in need of more nephrology nurses can go online here and also post their need and be able to direct those nurses um, to them and to their organizations to see if they can come and help as well. David, clearly this is a really important effort by ANA. I'm just wondering, how do they handle helping with any of the costs related to traveling to a different part of the country or for, for you know, living somewhere else? I'm just curious as to sort of how that part of this process works. Well, I had spoken with the ANA people, and I know that they are currently trying to develop a section on the, the application form or the, the form that identifies and connects you with the facility about what the facility will pay for and how that's going to be provided to be able to assist the, those nurses who are willing to go to the hotspots and to be able to serve. So that one is more incumbent upon the facility or the system to pay for, but there's an understanding by the systems and by the facilities that they are going to need to be able to underwrite some of those expenses. Um, and that is going to be a part of the process when you go online there. Again, I'm going to just repeat this one more time. Uh, I'm sorry to bore everybody, but it's www.annanurse.org, and you'll be able to find it there. The third issue I wanted to raise with you was around recent information from the Trump administration about the need to report uh, COVID-19 cases in nursing facilities. What's the administration trying to accomplish with this, this announcement? As you know, we've heard some very sad news coming out of nursing homes. Um, the virus definitely takes a very uh, heavy toll in that environment quite often. There has been some concern about the balancing the need to protect the privacy of those patients in nursing homes with the ability of family members of other patients to know what is happening there. So this is the first step, I think, that we're going to see. And in this step, um, the government, this has all occurred very recently, the government has that has made it clear that all nursing homes must report their COVID-19 numbers, their cases, to CDC. But one thing that they should probably know is that in saying this, they have written that in addition to reporting to CDC, they have stated that in rulemaking that will follow, and that's, those are the magic words, in rulemaking that will follow, we will also be requiring the, that facilities notify its residents and their representatives to keep them informed of the conditions inside the facility. So that's a pretty big step if, if they're going to go to the point where they're going to actually propose rules that require you to give that information to other patients in their nursing home and their family members. Um, it's also really important to remember that once you start doing uh, um, standards like this, once you start taking steps like this, within a nursing facility, it is reasonable to assume that it will get extended to other facilities. I'm not saying that it will end up at dialysis facilities at the moment, but I'm just saying this is worth watching. It's an interesting 
observation, and I'm, I was struck when I saw the announcement that they specifically said they were building on recent recommendations from the American Healthcare Association and Leading Edge, which are both, um, you know, nursing home industry associations. So there seems to be kind of at least two potential trends taking place. One is the federal government, particularly HHS, and in this case, the, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, working with the community and sort of working with the leading organizations in the community. And then the point that you just made around um, that, that once they start in a certain sector, um, changing these types of policies, it's likely that they would then apply them in other parts of the healthcare um, setting and, and what that could potentially mean for ASN and its members in the broader kidney community. What are the other sort of similar trends that you're seeing just from a macro level as we think about some of these policy changes that are taking place um, in response to the pandemic? Well, you also are seeing this take place uh, in terms of long-term long -term health uh, facilities. Um, you're seeing it in terms of SNFs, as we call them, skilled nursing facilities. You've already begun to see uh, pieces of the policy extended throughout those types of different um, venues and the regulations that govern operations in those facilities. Various rules that have come out, various proposals that have come out, have kind of extended and gone through and they've woven themselves through the various different venues that are used in the healthcare system, in addition to just hospitals, in addition to just the classic nursing home setting, but also in all the ones that deal with acute care, um, that deal with other facilities and deal with other styles, uh, with other venues. So the, the fourth and final policy issue I want to raise with you today is around the fact that, that a number of entities, including the administration, are starting to describe the process, the phases for reopening healthcare facilities for non-emergent care. And just curious as to both your reaction to those announcements, but also I'd really like to hear sort of your thoughts as to how this is going to play out over the next month, two months, three months. There was something I heard in the announcement that I, of this opening up process, this phase one that they're calling it, that I liked a lot. And it was actually a quote by uh, Seema Burma, the administrator of CMS, who said point blank, this isn't going to be like a light switch. It's more like a sunrise where it's going to be a gradual process. And I liked that analogy very much. I also thought it was, it was uplifting and good to hear. And in so doing, they're beginning to, to outline what are the things that a hospital system, hospital, hospital, system, healthcare system should be evaluating and evaluating in terms of their locality, their region, before they begin to consider offering non-emergent, non-COVID-19 healthcare, and that would include elective surgery, elective procedures. Um, so that's a really kind of critical issue that we've been facing for the, throughout this pandemic, is that with the responsible conservation of resources, a lot of elective procedures have been pulled back. This has been really difficult for a lot of people in nephrology, because, kidney care, because unfortunately in some areas, the placement of vascular access, PD catheters, so forth, have been placed in that category and have really slowed down or it's not come to a halt completely. So having the ability to open some of those pathways back up will, will be very important to kidney patients. Um, but it is, uh, it is something that's going to need to be done thoroughly, cautiously, uh, with a broad view of everything that's happening in that community, as is everything else is going to be as we begin to think about what the next couple months, the next year are going to look like in opening up our society and how it functions. We talked a little bit last week about the mandatory model, the ETC, and the fact that, that it, you know, initially there was a lot of thought that the final rule would be released around April 1st, and that that's clearly been delayed in, in light of what's happening with the pandemic. I'm just struck, you know, as I'm listening to you describe kind of the phases and the plan for starting to reopen the healthcare arena, if you will. Any update, or what's the update on, on the final rule related to the ETC, the mandatory model? 
In conversations that we've been having with uh, CMS, they currently are still in a holding pattern. I, I would liken it to one of an airplane circling an airport. They know they have to land at some point, but they still have enough fuel to keep going for the moment. Um, they they realize that the timing would be very unfortunate if they were to give out the final rule right now. There's too many things that that everyone in the healthcare field is facing, particularly those in kidney care are facing. And to layer that on top of them, I think would just be very frustrating at the moment. Uh, ASN remains committed uh, to all the different pieces of the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative um, that was in executive order. It remains committed to the ETC model um, and has made recommendations for how we believe it should be improved. But at the moment, it's it's not, I, it's not time at the moment just to release that. So I think they understand that, um, and they're looking to this uh, complex environment and trying to make sure that they don't announce anything that maybe hasn't been modified to adjust to the new current situation that we're in. Remember, the ETC model had at its core both increased transplant and increased home dialysis, particularly PD. This is definitely happening now in, in the light of this crisis, and there's been a very noticeable uh, increase in the number of people who are being treated with PD or being prepared for home dialysis. So, I mean, in a lot of ways, the things that were in the ETC have not gotten lost. If anything, they've become more underscored and more important in this current environment. So I think that the, there's going to be a lot of room for this to continue on and to be a very positive change for kidney patients. But the timing of, of where we place our resources right now is very critical. And uh, we need to also respect that the people on the front lines have got a tremendous amount uh, that they are shouldering and a tremendous amount of responsibility that they are shouldering. And we need not unnecessarily add to it right at this moment. Your point's really well taken. I mean, everything I've read is that that one of the after effects of this pandemic will be the acceleration of a number of trends that were already occurring in our society, but but that this experience will just will sort of accelerate what was going to happen. So, you know, one example is the shift in terms of how we, you know, cultural or entertainment content, particularly movies, you know, more from a home-based streaming service as opposed to going to theaters, you know, accelerating people's comfort level with with sort of food delivery and thinking creatively about how you deliver food to the home from restaurants as opposed to going, you know, into, into restaurants. Um, obviously, what you just described in terms of a number of aspects of the uh, executive order on advancing American kidney health probably being accelerated because of this. Um, it's just it's really interesting how, you know, as we think through the rest of this year, but then, you know, the next couple of years, what's likely to happen and, and then also things that perhaps were starting to happen that may not. So my final question to you would be, given that, if you if you sort of agree with the premise around this acceleration, what should we be looking for in the policy arena that that hasn't sort of come to light yet, but you think it will in the next month, in the next three months, by the end of the year? That's a tough one because I, my mind goes right now to the, the big one that we have talked about, which is going to really, I think, become a, a significant influence in healthcare after we move them, after we emerge from this crisis, and that would be telehealth. And so if telehealth is going to make but it's going to make a tremendous difference in the way a lot of the future programs and, and future efforts are going to be considered um, if it's successful at this point, at this juncture. So I have to wonder about that in terms of what really comes out of telehealth, because with telehealth comes something that could really make a big preventative difference, particularly with hospitalizations. And that is not the same thing as telehealth, but remote patient monitoring. That could become the really big one next as we see this. Once we get telehealth in place and we become much more comfortable with it, if we really get to a place that we're really utilizing remote patient monitoring a great deal, we can really begin to cut off a lot of problems for patients in advance. Um, and that's, that's including things like electronic scales that actually they ask patients to get on once in the morning and once in the evening. 
uh, that's very useful in diabetes control. Um, there's all types of different technologies that could come about there and be able to use those and have policy accept them and make them valid conduits for reporting information is really important. So for example, one thing out of telehealth that has never been done is that all of our listeners here, they all know very much what it means to have something risk adjusted when it comes to your payments from the government um, or how your program is going to be uh, evaluated. Risk adjustment was something that only could be reported back to the government through face-to-face -face healthcare visits. We are now going to allow telehealth visits to be a part of reporting on risk adjustment. And at that point, you're beginning to burrow down even to another level of really evaluating what your patient is facing, what are the complications, what are the things that should be adjusted so we can have reasonable expectations in, in the outcomes and in what we should be paying for. So those are a couple of the areas that come to my mind. Thanks, David. I enjoyed our conversation. We really covered a lot of ground from the joint letter with the National Kidney Foundation concerning um, rationing of care, efforts to promote what ANA is doing related to helping identify nephrology nurses to help in, in hotspots, the new information from the administration around reporting cases of COVID-19 in nursing facilities, as well as the plans for starting to reopen healthcare facilities for non-emergent care. So really appreciate you taking the time covering all those issues, plus uh, a little sidebar into telehealth. So thank you very much. Thank you. As always, I enjoyed it. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology, all rights reserved. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. This podcast should not be used in a medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified healthcare provider if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast from the American Society of Nephrology.